the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. Good news. Hallelujah. Amen. Good news. One day, walking on streets of gold. Give the Lord a shout of praise just for that. Y'all don't get excited for heaven enough. Amen. You don't get excited for our home in glory. Amen. Good news. One day. Amen. On streets of gold. Good news. Amen. We'll be with our loved ones. We give honor, praise, and glory to the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. We've been worshiping the Lord up in here this morning. Amen. The Lord is good. Amen. And he's greatly to be praised. Amen. We thank the Lord for our choirs, our musicians. Amen. Amen. They, amen. Give them a round of applause. Amen. We thank the Lord. We are so blessed. Amen. I don't know. The choir's been sounding all. They've been sounding marvelous. Amen. Give them a round of applause. Amen. 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 We truly thank the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. We got a word from the Lord. We began a brand new series today. That's going to help us and grow us, stretch us in our faith. Genesis chapter 25 25th chapter, I should say, begins a colorful, classic, real, biblical story of a relationship between two fraternal brothers. It's a powerful, real story. It's not fiction. A real story about the grandsons of a great patriarch by the name of Abraham. Amen? Now, we are so used, rooted, uh, if you've been in church, who's been in church for a long time? I'm going to raise my hand. Amen. If you've been in church for a long time, we're so used to hearing the preacher say this. You know the story. Am I right about it? You know the story. But I come to realize that the 21st century church, this postmodern society, in the midst of this postmodern society, this new emerging church is not so familiar with the story. Amen? We think that folks know the story. But the new church don't know the story. Amen? They don't understand. They don't know the new, the, um, the new um, Old Testament, I should say, the, the story in the Old Testament. With the Old Testament narrative. Amen? Meaning that the new church folks are not so much acquainted with the old story, amen? And we just assume that they know it, amen? The Old Testament historic account that God deliberately placed in the inspired word of God to demonstrate his faithfulness to his promises, his sovereignty to his people, watch this, in human history. Everybody don't know the old story, amen? Everybody don't know about Esau and Jacob. Everybody don't know about Isaac and Rebecca. And the new church is not so familiar with the story, amen? And so the Bible tells us that the Bible itself is one grand story. And if we miss out on the Old Testament, rooted, if we miss out on the Old Testament, we, we miss out on the richness of the story. The Old Testament is intended for you and I to glean and to grow and to look at the narratives and, 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 and really focus and ask the question, what can we pull out of the Old Testament? Jesus himself, when it came down to the Old Testament, he always pointed to the Old Testament. Why? Because he said in the Gospels, the Old Testament speaks of me. It speaks of me. Amen. So we also should have a Christocentric lens when it comes down to the Old Testament. And we who are the New Testament saints, we should be able to apply the original meaning of the passages of the true story. How can we take the old story and apply it to our lives? And that's what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks. Come to realize a lot of folks don't know the old story. And so we're going to glean it because guess what? We need the old story so that we can walk in the new story. Can I get a witness? I want to draw your attention to the book of Genesis, chapter 25. 
And we're going to look at an old story. And we're going to be teaching and learning, extracting from the text and how it applies to us. Watch this. Come to realize that the church now wants a lot of sensationalism. They want to feel good. Amen. They want to shout. But watch this. When that shout leaves you, what you going to have? You need truth to grow you, to go deep into your soul and your spirit. So when the day of trouble comes, you're able to stand like an old oak. Amen. And so we're going to look at the old story. Amen. The book of Genesis chapter 25 gives us an old story. And inside these scriptures, we won't get it all done today. We, it's going to take us a couple Sundays to look at this. Amen. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel, the army, from Padon Aram, the sister of Laban, the army. And Isaac, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. And the older will serve the younger. And when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. Lord, have mercy. The first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. He was named Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. And Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And that is why he was also called Edom. And Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is it to, what, what good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread, some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Whoa, let's grow up, Rooted. Let's do some Old Testament work. Amen? Let's do some Old Testament work. And let's look at this. We can learn from the narrative. This is a narrative. We can learn from the narrative. There's a lot of moving parts in just this, these scriptures alone. Amen. Some great lessons for you and I to grab from the account of Esau and Jacob and their parents. We're going to learn from their parents, Isaac and Rebekah. Let's preach from a theme, the imperfect godly family that a perfect God can still use. Oh, when we speaking. Oh, you think your family all that tight? The imperfect. The imperfect family. That a perfect God can still use. Oh, you should get happy with that. Hallelujah. The inner, very inner core of God's heart is that every family be a godly family. And God longs for families to watch this, to believe in him, to love him, to trust him, to follow him, and to obey him. That's the inner core of God's heart. You may have your seats. That's what God wants. Amen? The truth 
this morning. We're going to take our time. We're not in no hurry. Amen. Amen. I've learned that almost 30 years of preaching that you, you don't need to rush. You take your time. We, the Lord says so. We'll be back here next week if God says so. The truth is all true godly families suffer trials of life. I don't care who you think you are or who you think your family is and all of this. Nah, 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 nah. We all suffer. All families go through. Amen. All families touch life. Life is real. All families touch sin. Yeah, it happens. But through this narrative, we see that God cares for and looks after he also strengthens and upholds all godly families. And what I mean that no matter how severe the trial is in your family, watch this, God is still with you. No matter how bad it looks, God is still in the midst of each godly family, working in the midst of each godly family, as we're going to see in this narrative. Amen? God is still at work. Amen? Amen? But unfortunately, Rooted, if the truth be told, and one thing I'm always going to do is tell the truth, Amen. is that all families are not godly families. Because you in church don't make you a godly family. Let's make sure we're straight about that. Amen? Many families ignore and neglect the Lord. Many families spend no time with God. Many families don't even think about the Lord at all. Amen. Amen. Don't even think about God. Amen. Some families even find themselves cursing God. Some families find themselves denying him. Some families uh, find themselves questioning his existence. We got this new movement now um, that's in the midst of trying to hit godly families. This this. This new movement of uh, this, uh, 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 what's it called? The, 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 the Jewish movement, which is uh, the, the, the black Nazarite movement. Israelite, thank you. See, I'm out of touch even with that, amen? This new movement now that's trying to take folks away from Christianity and, and, and Jesus of being the true son of God. Amen? All families are not... Godly families. And I'd like to spend just a couple of Sundays checking out Isaac's family. We want to learn something from Isaac's family. Amen. Isaac, if you don't know who Isaac is, Isaac is Abraham's boy. He was the one that was on Mount Moriah where, where Abraham took him up on the altar. Y'all remember? Some of you know the story. Some of you older saints know the story. The promise that was given to Abraham. Passed down to his son Isaac. Called the Abrahamic covenant. A covenant uh, that God makes with Abraham. Amen. Powerful covenant that is still in effect to this very day. It says in Genesis 12 uh, verses 1 and 3. The Lord had said to Abram. Go from your country, your people, your father's household. To the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. The Abrahamic covenant. God, what he did, he, he called out a special people. God can do that. He called out a special people. We, we know them as the Israelites, the Jews. Notice in the Abrahamic covenant, he says, those who curse you, <laughs> going to be cursed. You better hold on to that. You better hold on to that. Amen. And he, God called out a special people for himself. And through that special people, watch this, through, through that special people, God will bless the whole world. Whole world is blessed through the Abrahamic covenant because it's through the Abrahamic covenant that our Savior Jesus comes through. And those who put their trust in Jesus are blessed by this Abrahamic covenant. Amen. Salvation for all people comes by way of this covenant. Amen. 
Jesus comes by way of this promise. Not only does he come by way of this promise, but watch this, his future kingdom yeah. on the earth is predicated on this promise, this covenant. And so as we see here, it's a promise from Abraham passed down to Isaac. Now, now, now walk with me as we jump into the text. I hope you got your Bibles or on electronic device, whatever you have. We're going we're gonna to study the next couple of weeks. We're going to go deep and, and get strong. Amen. Because that's what we need, some strength. And as we jump into this text, notice one of the first things that I want you to go back in the text and look at. One of the first things in establishing a godly family is over here in Genesis 25, as we began in verse 19 and 20. It says, this is the account of the family line of Abram's son, Isaac. Abram became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. The first thing before we go anywhere rooted, the first thing we want to talk about and look at is, is the first thing in establishing a godly family between a man and a woman is a marriage. Huh? I'm talking about between a man and a woman. I ain't talking about two men. I ain't talking about two women. I'm talking about between a man and a woman is a marriage. We see that here. The covenant and the commitment of marriage is the foundation of a godly family. Amen. Isaac, watch this. Isaac didn't move Rebecca into his tent before to live with him before he married her. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. No, no. If you look at the text, it says that he was 40 years old when he married Rebecca. Amen. And as we look at this, we must understand that the foundation for a godly family is this whole covenant thing called marriage. Yes. Amen. I ain't getting too many amens with that. Yes. Amen. Yes. So, 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 so what are you saying, Pastor? What, what are you saying here? Watch this. Well, Genesis tells us this. It tells us this over here in Genesis 2.24 at the very beginning of creation. Uh, look at what God says. That is why a man leaves his fall. Amen. You got to let these boys go. Huh? You mamas got to let them go. They, they, they can't be around y'all. They got to let them go. So that one day they can what? Find themselves a wife. Huh? You ain't got to amen me. That I feel like preaching today. Huh? So they can find themselves a wife. And if you notice anything in the garden, watch this. Hold on, sisters. Watch this. Uh, Adam was already working. He already had a job before he got the woman. So it says that a man leaves his father and his mother and you is united to his wife and they will become one flesh. That's the foundation for the godly family. Amen. That's the see. And Jesus, he reiterates it all again through the Gospels. Jesus backs up what Elohim God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit instituted at the very beginning. Jesus comes back, the man Christ Jesus. He enterates marriage. Uh, in this world that we, this postmodern liberal world we live in. Watch this. Now don't, now somebody said, but don't, don't, don't. You mean to tell me that we're not a godly family? Uh, uh, mom and dad shacking together? No. No. No, 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 no. So you mean to tell me that me and my living partner don't have a godly family? No, I, 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 I'm telling you that the foundation for a godly family between a man and a woman, I ain't talking about single moms, I, I ain't talking about single dads, I'm talking about a man and a woman who cohabitating, the, the foundation is marriage. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's the foundation. Nobody wants to hear that any longer. All this compromise going on, no, that's the foundation. And one thing about God, he's immutable, he isn't going to change. That's the foundation for the godly family between a man and a woman is holy matrimony. Can I get a, 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 a amen or 
Is it the truth? Amen. And so we see here that with, with, with Isaac, it says that he married Rebecca. He, he obeyed God and married Rebecca. He obeyed God. And we need some more men who profess Christ to obey God. Amen. Amen. And so as we look at this, watch this and understand this. Notice this. Notice in the text. We exegete in the text. Tell your neighbor exegete. We're going to pull from the text so you can know that I ain't making this stuff up. Look what it goes back and look what it says here. It says, and Isaac prayed to the Lord. Genesis 25 verses 21 and 22 uh, on the behalf of his wife. That's a man right there. Because she was childless. They didn't have no babies. And the Lord answered his prayers and, wife Re and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. Watch this. And so as we look at this, we see something here. Isaac and Rebecca couldn't have no babies, but note something here. Note something here. Prayer was a significant part of the family life. The father's praying. The mama's praying. Amen. And that is the, that is the main con uh, uh, common denominator of the godly family, that the family is being bathed with prayer. And so watch this. It took 20 years of praying to God. It says, watch this. It says that he didn't have the baby until he turned 60. And I, and I feel sorry for the brother because I can't even imagine having no babies at no 60. Lord Jesus, man. It's hard enough now with grown kids. Can you imagine some babies? At 60 years old, Lord have mercy. More power to them. Power to the people. 20 years he and his wife were praying. 20 years. And, man, look, we want something to happen in a week. We want, it, it, it don't happen what, yesterday. We, but for 20 years, they seeking God's face. For 20 years, they took it to God. This is, uh, we're talking about the godly family. They take it to God in prayer, amen, until God prevailed, amen. First Chronicles 16, amen, 11 says, look to the Lord in his strength and seek his face. What a great, what a great principle it shows us here. See, you can glean from the Old Testament. Look at this, for 20 years, Rebecca is childless for 20 years. And, 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 and her husband is praying with her. And she's praying and they're coming together. And watch this. They're seeking God's face. Man, if we had more husbands and wives that would pray together and, and seek God's face. Huh? Notice who was leading in prayer. Isaac, brothers. Amen. Isaac, amen. Now, now, now as we understand this, there's a lesson for the family. You know, all families got issues. No family comes away unscathed. No family is exempt. All families got issues. Pastor Webb's family got issues. Your family got issues. Amen? But watch this. But I do know, I do know that when we begin to seek God's face, I do know that things begin to change. I, I do know that when we call upon his name, that he's faithful. Now, I'm going to be perfectly transparent with you this morning. I'm going to be perfectly transparent with you. Amen? Long time ago, I didn't pray like I pray now. When I was a young daddy preacher, amen, a young daddy in my 20s and 30s, I didn't pray like I pray now. Why? Because I had it all, I thought, under control. It's something when they little and you, I'm in control. But I find out now that I'm praying more than I ever prayed before. I'm find out now that me and my wife are on our knees. I'm an old daddy now. And I realize something now. I ain't got no control. I realize something now. I don't have no strength. I realize something now that everything is not in my hand, but I can call upon the one who's able to move and is able to turn and able to change some things. Yeah, you learn that when you get a little older. Yeah, and so we see here, we see two things. Marriage was on the table, and we see prayer was essential. Y'all gleaning anything from this? This is rich stuff, amen? But watch this. Let's, let's get into this. We got, we got some Sundays. Watch this. Look at, look at the text. Go back to 
verse 23 and 26. It says, look at the story of two twins, fraternal twins. But there's a deeper meaning with Esau and Jacob. Watch this. Some of you, you say, but I don't know the story. I'm going to tell you the story. Watch this. In Genesis 25, 23, it says, the Lord said to her, because there was a jostling in her womb. Two babies in the womb. Watch this. There was strife in her womb. There was conflict in her belly. We got two nations inside of one woman battling. <laughs> Before they were even born. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Lord. And look, look, look. He says, and two nations, the Lord tells her, she, she says to the doctor, don't you know that he is Jehovah Rapha? Don't you know he is a doctor? And so she goes to the doctor. He said, what is going on in my belly? What is going on on the inside of me? Amen. And he tells her this. He says, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. And one people will be stronger than the other. And the older, watch this. We're going somewhere with this next week. The older is going to serve the younger. You better come back next week because I'm going to give you a Meraki with something next week. Amen. So as we look at this, watch this. Understand something here. And so the deeper meaning God was telling her, God was, was showing her the blessing that was showered upon the family. The Lord tells Rebecca, Rebecca that he was choosing her family to raise up two nations of people. That's some special stuff. Both, both sons will be ancestors of a great nation of people. Two nations. Two twins in Rebecca's womb. And now, now watch this, Rooted. This is predestinational. This, is, this right here I'm going to share with you is eschatological, meaning it's futuristic. This is soteriological. This is salvation. This is, this is sovereign. This is some deep theological teaching, deep meaning here. The inside of Rebecca was a believing nation and an unbelieving nation. It's some deep stuff. Inside her womb was a saved nation and an unsaved nation. Inside her womb, amen, God tells her that the one who comes out first out of the womb, amen, the oldest would be the one that will serve the one who comes out last, who's going to be the youngest. Huh? The first should be last. And watch this. As we look at this, God's sovereignty and God's sovereignty, because church is getting away from the power and the sovereignty of God. God chooses, God chooses, amen, the son that he would have to represent his glory. You didn't get that. You didn't get that. God chose one son over the other son to carry on the inherited promise that will come all the way down into our lifetime, all the way into the millennial reign, and all the way into eternity. God says, I'm going to choose. Lord, have mercy. Look as we look at this. Watch this. The boys weren't even born yet. But listen to what Paul, the Apostle Paul, talks about when he talks about the choosing of Jacob and Esau. Look what he says over here in Romans, the ninth chapter. He says this in Romans 9, 14. He says, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does, it, it, it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. I want y'all to get that. I want y'all to see the sovereignty of God. Look, he said it ain't got nothing to do with the person. This has to do with my mercy. This has to do with my grace. Now, now we got to put this and understand this. Amen. See, see listen. 
First, let's get this out of the way, because I know somebody might be thinking this. He, he goes on to say, and we're going to see, he's going to say, Jacob, I love, and Esau, I hate. Whoa, that's some deep stuff. Well, hold up, before we go any further, let's, let's get something out of the way. God is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the sovereign Lord. He is uh, the, the majestic one of the universe. Let me get this under your belt because we got some folks that think that they a little bit know a little bit more than God. Watch this. God can do whatever he wants. Yeah. However he wants. Yeah. Whenever he wants. And how he wants to do it. Yeah. You better get that. See, once you understand the sovereignty of God, you will learn to take yourself off the seat and put him in the proper place where he reigns as king of kings and lord of lords. See, he does whatever he wants to do. And watch this. If you go back in the text, he, he, he tells us this. He goes back in here and he says this over here in Romans 9, 14 and 16. He says this. He says, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'm, whom I'm going to have mercy. Let me go back to, go back to a slide. Go back to, to Romans 9, 10 and 13. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by her father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election. You put that up on the screen. Might stand. Not by works, by him who calls, she was told. The older will serve the younger as it is written, Jacob, I love, but Esau, I hate. Now, 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 we're looking at the story of two sons. And look what God says here. Watch this. This is the word of God. Watch this. What do you mean that you, that you hate Esau? You God, you hate Esau? But this is not, any, this is not a personal emotional hate. This is God choosing one man in his nation and rejecting another man in his nation. Watch this. It is two nations in her womb. And God is choosing one nation that will carry the promised line of the seed and the promised inheritance that will pass through Jacob. Who he's going to change his name later to what? Israel. He's going to pass it through it, amen? And we see that it's going to pass through him, and then Esau, the descendant of the Ammonites, won't get it. What is God saying? He tells us this in Malachi. He says, Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, I have loved you, said the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau have hated and I have turned his hill country into a wasteland. He's left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Now watch this. God ain't personally hating Esau. But what God is, who's a foreknowledge God, a God who knows the beginning and the end, know that the Edomites are an unbelieving nation. Amen. See, one thing about God, God knows who belongs to him. See, that's why you ain't got to go around. and If you belong to God, you ain't got to worry about it. Watch this. Because God knows you. See, if God knows you and you belong to God, you ain't got nothing to worry about. God says, I know who belongs to me. So as we look at this, listen to this. Watch this. Listen. If you are saved today, it's not because you deserved it. It's not because you work for it. But it's because, watch this, you are a family member because of the free mercy and the free grace of God. If nothing else, if you don't have nothing else to be happy for, be happy over free mercy. Be happy over free grace. Be happy over the fact that he chose you. Be happy over the fact that he elected you. Be happy over the fact that he drew you. It's because of God's mercy in his grace. Look what it says in Titus 3, 7. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having a hope of eternal life. I want that to sink in. That's why we praise him. That's why we worship him. That's why we serve him. 
Watch this. Because of what is said here, because of free mercy and free grace, God is rejecting one nation over another nation. And to the other nation, he's extending, watch this, free mercy and free grace. Watch this. Jacob is not better than Esau. Esau is not better than Jacob. Watch this. Jacob is a sinner. Esau is a sinner. Watch this. The nation of Israel is not better than any other nation. But God in his infinite wisdom, God in his free mercy, God in his grace. And so you and I, we ain't better than the unbeliever, but God, because of his great love towards you and I, because of his free grace, picked us up, turned us around, wrote our names in the land's book of life. Why? Because of free mercy. That's why we should be walking around all day talking about amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was blind. <laughs> once was lost. We should be so grateful for free mercy. That's why nobody can get beside themselves. That's why nobody can get the big head. That's why nobody can look their nose down at somebody else. Because guess what, sweetheart? You're only where you are by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, by the goodness of God that he rained down upon you. And so as we see this, catch this. Even though both nations are sinful, even though both brothers are sinners, <sighs> amazing grace. Lord, have mercy. And so if you look at this, watch this, y'all. We, we bring this together. Watch this. Look at this. Esau means red. He's rugged. Here we going somewhere. Watch this. Look what it says in Genesis 25, 24. And when the time came for her to give birth, there was twin boys in her womb. The first came out was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment. Unusual hairiness. Amen. He comes out, right? Mother's womb, right? But watch this, watch this. He's a man who's going to be rugged in life. He's a man that is sturdier. He's a sportsman. He's a sportsman. He's a great, skillful hunter. He, he's a guy that's carefree and footloose. He's a man that, that determines his own direction. A man that sets his own course. He, he's a worldwide traveler. He's the man of the world. This man called Esau. Amen? He's a man of adventure. He has unbridled behavior. Amen. Uh, he's, a, 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 he's a, let's put it in, in 24. He's a thug boy. That's what he is. He's a thug boy. But his brother, watch this, check this out. Look at this. We see something here, but Jacob means to grasp the hill. It means to follow behind. Can you imagine one baby out and the other baby right on his heels? One baby come out, another baby grabbing him. As he come out, another baby, watch this. And, and, and it looks like the other baby trying to pull him back in. He, it looks like the other baby, Jacob, trying to pull him back in the womb so that he can get out first. Because whoever gets out first gets the inherited blessing. And it looks like he's trying to bring him back in. And then guess what? In all reality, he was. Because there was a war going on. Y'all better walk with me today. Yes, sir. And so if we look at this, watch this. The struggle is real. And Jacob, it means, and the idiom means a deceiver. It means, it means, watch this. It means a deceiver in behavior. And we're going to see how he's a trickster. Jacob is a slickster, man. He's a slickster. You may have one. He's a quiet man. Amen. He's a tent dwelling man. That means that he, he, he stays at the crib. He, he, he deals with the people. He, he's more concerned about the estate. Amen? Not like his brother. His brother's out there getting it. His brother's out in the wild. Amen? And so as we look at this, listen, listen, watch this. Even before they were born, 
There's a struggle in the family. Even before they were born, they were struggling with each other in the womb. Catch this. In their prenatal strife, prenatal strife, foreshadowed what was to come. They were fighting in the womb. Prenatal strife, amen? And so watch this. Listen, all families, say after me, all families. Because I don't want you to think that your family is exempt. All families. Battle with carnality. All families battle with some level of carnality, some level of fleshliness. All families, a godly family becomes fleshly and carnal. A godly family can quickly begin to neglect God's word. It can happen. Amen. A godly family can find itself neglecting his worship. A godly family can find itself beginning to focus on the things of the world. Possessions, fame, position, pleasure, recreation, huh? sex, popularity, money. And forget all about the promises of God. A godly family, y'all walk with me? We're talking about an imperfect godly family that a perfect God can still use. We're talking about the family of Isaac and Rebecca. No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm talking about my family. And I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about an imperfect family that got stuff all in the midst of it, but God still chooses that I still can use them. Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord, have mercy. So watch this. Listen, listen, listen. It happened with this family. Let me get, let me get this one point out. We'll be done for the day. It happened with this one family. Listen, Jacob and Rebecca were in sin. Mom and daddy was in sin. You say, well, pastor, how do you get that? Well, they made a grievous mistake, and we'll see through the scriptures, through the chapters. See, one thing that they did, they passed on to something down to Esau and Jacob. They passed down something. Y'all ready? They passed down a generational curse. Did you know that a mom and dad can pass down generational curses? Don't you know that some of us right now are still stuck in generational curses that have been passed down from grandma and granddad and father and mother and down to us and down to our children? And, and what happened was, watch this, Rebecca and Isaac, they passed down a generational curse down into Jacob and Esau. And you say, but, but what was the family Curse. Look what it says. It says this in Genesis 25, 28. Y'all, are y'all still awoke? Y'all still on board? Here we go. Watch this. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, he loved Esau. But Rebecca loved Jacob. See, the generational curse that they passed on was the curse called favoritism. Called partiality. Call me loving one child more than the other. Me honoring one child more than the other. <laughs> Woo! It was a generational curse that's being passed down. Amen? Being passed down. Amen? A favoritism. Amen? And, and, and we see here, check it out. Check it out. Isaac favored Esau. Why? Because he loved his spirit. He loved that manliness. He loved that, that hunter in him. He loved that wild game that he brought home to the house. He loved his rough, tough, carefree, footloose lifestyle. He probably loved it because he wanted to live it himself. He liked that. He liked what Esau brought to the table. Amen? But then, but then, watch this. Rebecca, she favored the other boy. Jacob, amen? She loved his mannerism. She, she loved his responsibility. She loved, she loved the way that he worked with the servants and, and she loved the way that, that Jacob uh, 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 did stuff with the, with the estate. But she also loved the fact of the promise that she heard from God that Jacob would be over a nation. Yeah. Amen? And so what Rebecca does, she starts conniving in chapter 27 with her son Jacob to deceive Isaac over a blessing. What are we talking about today? In the text, we see that what can wreck family?
families are generational curses. And the one generational curse in particular is having favoritism. It's wrong for a parent to favor a child over another child. I'm talking now. I'm, I'm speaking now. Amen. The Bible tells us this. Watch this. It shows us this here. He says in James, he says, but if you show favoritism, you sin. See, Jacob and Rebecca was in sin. See, we don't call it sin, but that's what the Bible calls it. Amen. And they cause, they help to encourage the competition between the two brothers. Mom and dad, they help to encourage it, amen? And, and so, as we look at this, we'll see later, Jacob, when he grows up, this same generational curse carries because now Jacob got favoritism over one wife over the other. Yeah. Amen? He loves Rachel more than he loves Leah. Yeah. Amen? And because of that, he passed it on down. Amen? He loves Rachel's baby, and this is like 21st century. This is like, this is like made for a lifetime. Amen? He loves, he loves Rachel's children more than he loves Leah's children. He loves Rachel's son, Joseph, more than he loved the other ten brothers. And so now it passes all the way down. And now the strife is going down to another generation. And now you got some brothers mad at another brother. Why? Because of the generational curse of favoritism. Somebody better get up in here and understand what I'm saying. Let me tell you something right now so we understand. I've been a parent for 60 years. Amen? Not 60 years, 40 some years, I should say. <laughs> and you know what parents got to guard against? Showing favoritism. Partiality. Creating division within a family. Because it creates bitterness and separateness. Amen? See, see, all that favoritism, at the end, we're going to see, guess what Esau tells his brother? I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, Jack. When I see you again, I'm going to put something up on you. You getting up out of here. You getting up out of here, shorty. I'm going I'm to take care of you when I see you. Don't let me see you because I'm going to deal with you. Mm. Watch this. You know what I realized? In Ephesians, it tells us something. We got to be careful about generational curses. Amen. And, and you know one thing I realized is this, that all of them got mess. See, see, Jacob had his mess and Esau had his mess. See, watch this. See, the Bible tells us this. It says, train up a child. Isn't that what the scripture says? It says, train up a child in the way that they will go, right? Amen. Train up a child in the way that they will go. Amen. That's what it tells us. Amen. And what it means that each child is bent different. Each child is bent a different way. And what I use for one child, I can't use for the same child because they're bent different. See, if I use what I use for one child on this child, I may break them, amen? But I got to know which way they're bent. I got to know which way they bent. One child may need a little bit of something, something, but this child might just need some verbal something, something. See, we see the generational curse here of favoritism. Now grab this. Generational curses comes in all forms. And guess what, y'all? We got to be careful of the generational curse trying to over, overtake over our families. We got generational curses in godly families. We got, we got curses of sexual immorality that goes from one generation down to the next generation. We got generational curses of poverty that you can't get yourself together. You keep staying in this fit of poverty, amen? Poor financial stewardship is a, general, uh, is a generational curse where we can never get our monies together. We can never be on time with our bills. We can never get on top. Generational curses of lies, addiction, generational curse of confusion, where there's always confusion and chaos in the families. It, it passed down from grandmom and granddad down to mom and dad and down to the next generation. Generational curses of homosexuality, generational curses of divorces, amen, laziness. Meanness. Some families is outright mean. It's a generational curse. 
Generational curse of heredity of disease is an emotional mental illness. Generational curse of female dominance where, watch this, we got the sisters running the family. And then we got generational curses where we don't have no male leadership in the family. Generational curses. And we see with Isaac's family, and not only was it favoritism, but we're going to see lies was another generational curse that plagued Isaac's them family. But I'm so glad that some in, in the generational curses, some of them are through the bloodline, but some is just by influence. Some uh, generational curses come by the bloodline. Amen. Some of the diseases we battle with. But a lot of the generational curses come by what you see. Comes by experience. Come by watching and experiencing and, and seeing how people conduct themselves that now I'm going to do what my mama and my daddy did or my grandfather did and I'm going to pass it all down. The Bible says this as we come to the close. Watch this. Just looking at this family. Look what it says in Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6. It says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Generation, God says, I'm going to pass it on down. Third and fourth generation, those who hate me, but showing love for a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandment. Let me close this thing out. Lamentation says this, I'll fall the sin and are no more, and we bear their iniquity. What are we talking about? Generational curses. And we see it in Isaac's family of favoritism. That's just one. But watch this. I'm so glad as we close that we ain't got to be bound by generational curses. Huh? You didn't know that, did you? You know, you know what breaks generational curses? I want you to write this down so I want you to know. You know what breaks a generational curse that's been going on for generations and generations and generations? Let me tell you what breaks it. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus breaks all generational curses and turns them down, the blood of Christ. It says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with the blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Watch this, watch this. To break generational curses, you got to get your family members saved. You got to see them come to the saving knowledge. Your children get saved. Your grandchildren get saved. Your great-grandchildren get saved. And what happens is, Ge the generational curses are now being broken through the blood of Jesus Christ. But not only are they broken through the blood of Jesus Christ, they're also broken through faith in Christ. Living faith in Christ breaks the curse. When you are living day to day, believing and trusting in the Lord, amen, putting your trust in him and living out this life that he has called you to live, you don't realize what you're doing. You're breaking curses. You're breaking all the curses that's been in your family for years. You're breaking it down. Why? Because your life is a living sacrifice. Now you're reflecting the glory of God and now you're walking upright and you're pleasing unto the Lord and you're breaking the curses. Not only is it the blood of Christ that breaks the curses. You say, well, pastor, how you know? Because we got a lot of curses in our family. But as I'm watching now, as folks are getting saved in the Webster family and, and not just in my immediate sisters and nephews, and as they start to come to the Lord, I'm watching generational curses being broken. And as we live before them and walking in faith, I'm watching generational curses being broken. But then the last thing that breaks the curse, generational curses, is repentance. It's when you and I learn that we can tell God that we messed up. That when we come to the Lord and say, Lord, I blew it again. I wasn't all that I should be. I, I, I didn't do everything that I should have done. And I ask for your forgiveness. Don't you know that when you come to the Lord in repentance, it breaks the curses. The enemy wants to keep us bound in generational curses. But when you call to the Lord and say, Lord, I agree with you over my sin, over my mess. Don't you know that the curses are being broken? We are breaking curses. 
Families are breaking curses. Mom and dads and godly families were breaking curses by the blood of Christ through living a life of faith with Christ and by repentance over our sins. That's how we break the curses. Look, what it, look how it closes. Look how we close this. Look what it says in the last slide. Look, look. You know I just read Exodus, right? And I just read Exodus. Look what it says real quick in Exodus. Look at the result. It says, go back to it and we close. It says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Look what he says. I'm punishing. Look what God says. He says, I'm punishing each generation. Did y'all see that? I'm punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Whoa! But I'm so glad God's a God of mercy. I'm so glad he's a God of grace. Watch this. As we close, watch this, because I don't want to leave you there. I want to leave you on a high note. Look what he says here in the text in verse 6. But showing love to a thousand of generations. Watch this. My wrath is on three or four generations. But when the blood of Christ comes, when forgiveness comes, when love comes, when repentance comes, when living by faith comes, watch this. My love goes down to a thousand generations I go beyond the three and four I'm going down to your grandchildren your great grandchildren your great great grand I'm going all the way down I'm going to break the curse break that curse so we learn and some y'all got to come back next week because we're going to see Esau and Jacob again And we're going to learn from the life of Isaac's family. Even though we have imperfect families, God says, I can still use you. Even though, watch this, our families touch stuff. I know mine do, but my head is still looking towards the hills. Because I know I serve a God that's able to do all things. You know how I know he can do it? Because he did it with me. Ah, he took a wretch like me and he raised me up so I know what he can do. Anybody know what he can do in your family? There's somebody that you need to pray for, somebody that you need to encourage because God got a blessing in store for him and he wants to raise him up. We're going to come back next week and we're going to look back into the life of Esau and Jay. Maybe one here today. You stand in need of this great salvation. Ain't no greater joy in the world. I'm thinking about Brother Richardson. Amen. Amen. Yesterday, passed from earth to glory. Praise the Lord. To be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. But watch this. He can only do that because he had a ticket. His ticket was stained with blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. He had it on him, amen, when he left from this earth to glory, imputed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Watch this. You need to be born again. You need to be saved. All this, watch this, church can't can't save you. You got to repent of your sin. Then you, you will become a part of the church when you give your life to Jesus. For God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but through him the world may be saved. Scriptures go on to say, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. He that believes on the Son has eternal life. He that does not believe in the Son of God, the wrath of God remains on him. Today, you can give your life to Jesus. Today, you can have new life. Today, you can become a brand new creation. Is there one? Just raise your hand and say, Lord, save me. Lord, be my master. Be, Lord, be my king. I put my trust in you. I repent of my sin, and I give my heart to you. Is there one? Is there one on TV, online? If that's you, call that number on the screen. Is there one in the sanctuary? Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Amen. We're going to learn the old story. We're going back to the old church. Thank you for joining us in service today. And as always, you can visit us on our website at www.rbfchurch.com as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope you have a safe and prosperous week.